Um, transformation, we started hearing about it, we're going to hear a little bit more about it from an amazing group. Uh, I just did the math and the five panelists in our next roundtable employ a total of half a million people between them and have annual revenues approaching half a trillion dollars between them. It's a very large group. Transformation, for those of you who don't travel in boardrooms and things, is what they talk when you have big companies doing existing things, how do you get them to go with the times? We've got every sector here. Yeah, please fill in right here. Isabel, I mean, Rosabeth, all the way over here. Everybody keep coming, keep coming. Everybody. Mr. Diller, there he is. Mr. Diller is here to, to be the, uh, the, the mischief maker because he enjoys transforming in, in industries. So, Russell Beth Cantor from Harvard Business School, Jacques Aschenbroich from, uh, from Valeo, Isabel Cocher from uh, NG, that must be therefore Thomas Bourbel, AXA, and Georges Plassat, Carrefour, and last, but by no means least, Mr. Barry Diller without his socks. As you'll notice, he is always in the south of France. Thank you. Um, good morning. First of all, congratulations to Publicis on the 90th anniversary. And isn't it fantastic to celebrate an anniversary by looking forward into the future as all of the companies represented here are today. So this is about transformation. We have five major sectors represented on this panel, all of which are transforming dramatically, provide opportunities for entrepreneurs, and are being transformed themselves by new technology. Retail, travel, insurance, energy, and transportation. So this is all about how bigger companies incorporate new technology, innovate in new technology, what startups might need to know about working with big companies, but also what CEOs like these struggle with as they think about transformation. And there are a number of things that are really different about this transformation. It's not just putting up a website or using, using digital technologies to become more efficient or an online version of whatever you're doing offline. We're talking about major transformation, a shift from selling products or even offering services to co-creating the nature of the end result with your customers. That's dramatically different. And it poses challenges inside the company. So how does the legacy business handle all of these new upstarts? How do they handle the entrepreneurs that you bring in? The legacy business says, we make all the money, but those innovators, they have all the fun. And that doesn't seem to be fair. So there's a challenge of doing both. There's a challenge of building a whole ecosystem because you don't just incorporate the new technology by yourself, you need partners. And you not only need a range of partners, so sometimes startups, sometimes acquisitions, you also need to partner with the public sector because otherwise they'll hold you back. Airbnb and Uber are actually illegal in many of the cities in which they're trying to do business. So if we don't work that out, we don't transform. And we have a transformation because of all of these forces, changes in the customer, use of partners in a different way, and a kind of employee, whether millennials or entrepreneurs, who actually don't really like to be managed. And all of you have to manage them one way or another or listen to them. And that's an issue in transformation. And this is a kind of transformation that you can't do by following a script. 
It's more like improvisational theater. You make it up as you go along. That is, you try, you test, hopefully you succeed, but if you fail, you regroup and do it again. That's a different kind of leadership. And then finally, we're in an era where not only are you disruptors being disrupted, but you have to disrupt yourselves. You have to figure out who is going to come along and change your sector, and you have to be there first. One of my favorite VC tech entrepreneurs and investors used to say, dream your worst nightmare and then invest in it. So I'm also going to ask you not only about your successes, but your worst nightmare about change. And um, I'm going to start, because he's all the way at the other end, with Barry Diller. Because, Barry Diller, you've been an executive in entertainment and media for a very long time. And in fact, you were at Fox and Paramount, and you gave us Fox News. No, I didn't. Oh, I thought you helped build Fox News. Oh, no, I built Fox Broadcasting. Oh, Ru Fox Rupert Broadcasting. Rupert Murdoch gave you Fox News. Okay, thank you. Because in America, we're not sure how we, whether to thank you or not. Um, but you were a visionary because you saw this coming and started investing in a portfolio of companies, IAC and then now the Expedia group of companies, long before others did. What made you see the change and are your peers back in the industry getting it? Well, everybody has their own experience, so you asked me mine. I simply saw that screens, 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 were being used in a way differently than I had come to use screens, which was to tell narrative stories. So for me, what a screen was, was to tell a story. What I found early in the 90s, 92, 93, was that screens could also be interactive. That in fact, very early days of uh, this confluence of televisions and computers and phones, uh, was creating actually another way to use screens. That fascinated me. So I started with home shopping, and then luckily the internet came along a couple of years later, and so we were a bit primed for interactivity. So mine was not, it was not vision. I just knew that this change in how you use screens was going to be was profound, and I wanted to understand it. And as part of understanding anything, you get opportunity. And so we just followed our dumb nose with various kinds of early opportunities, and we were very early in the internet. And that allowed us to build up a large group of companies that over the next 15 years uh, essentially mined this transformation. Well, you do have a lot of companies. I mean, you have about 200 travel booking sites in 75 countries and about 150 digital companies. That's a lot. That's enough. Yeah, so when I said... For this afternoon. You have a lot of, of, of independently-minded entrepreneurs in your portfolio. Some of them are pretty big, Match.com, et cetera, Expedia. How do you manage this new set of people, millennial entrepreneurs, don't want to be managed? How do you do it? Well, to a degree, you let them manage you because you can't manage vast groups of people. That's just not practical on any level. And look, if you have kind of a, 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 what I'd call some central values, I don't believe in culture, but I believe in values. Values actually can eventually form a culture. But if you have some absolute values, beyond that, everybody's got to sink, swim at what their own task is. We do not believe in synergy. We do not try and essentially manage for synergy. We do not manage for competition. We're quite happy to let anybody cannibalize anyone else. And so it's a very, uh, essentially, I mean, it's, it, it, it is relatively one cell, meaning it doesn't have a lot of brain in it, but the brain that is in it is mostly things you cannot do everything else you can and should do, and we encourage that. 
Wonderful. So if a company here were to be acquired by you, they could be guaranteed a degree of independence? No, we don't guarantee anybody anything. Okay. We just let them look at our infrastructure and we look at our history and then they decide for themselves whether they want to be part of it. Well, because this is a big issue because many big companies will buy startups promising technology and then immediately start destroying the things that made them unique. Yeah, but so that's we don't just, want that to happen. Well, that's just so, dumb. Not good. Right. So Tom Thomas, um, Thomas Verbelt. So you were also a pioneer in your industry. I mean, you have a long background um, in you, um, insurance. You were also at Boston Consulting Group. Um, so a consultant in finance, financial management. You headed Switzerland for Zurich. How did you or your company manage to see the importance of new media and be a pioneer in insurance in um, adding social media to connect with customers. How did you see it? Well, we simply felt the pressure. I mean, customers were asking us a very simple question. It is extremely easy to buy a book on Amazon. When will you finally make a purchase of an insurance policy that easy? And so this was a very valid question where we honestly had no answer to. Because the reality is, you go to an agency, the next day you phone the call center, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand has done yesterday. It's not a very pleasant experience, certainly not seamless, certainly not simple. So we simply started opening up uh, social media and let people interact in it. And it was very interesting to see that all of a sudden the satisfaction went up a lot because people got immediate response. We had to retrain our people who was doing call center business yesterday, did Facebook Messenger the next day. And it has really developed into something very interesting where we believe in and where the interaction is seamless, very close, very direct. And this is certainly something that we have piloted in, in many countries. The beauty of AXA is we are global. We can pilot it and then copy it to other countries. So I cannot imagine being without social media in insurance in the future. But other companies haven't done it. Are they catching up? And what will be your competitive advantage once they start doing it also? So it's true. I mean, everybody can do it because social media is accessible to everybody. But an idea is one thing. The impl implementation is the other thing. And what we are very fortunate about, we have a very good and innovative team of young people where we have managed to integrate the new ones into the old world that really push that and that push, push us every day to move forward. And the only way to stay ahead is to move faster than the others. So you had that set of young people who were pushing you. How did you encourage people in the legacy business used to doing things the way they had always done them to change? It's extremely difficult because uh, obviously if you infuse two people out of a hundred into a new world, uh, it's like planting a little seed uh, under trees with very big wings and big leaves. You get no sun and the seed will never have a chance to, to grow. What you need to show is I think we've started with the most innovative people of the legacy business, worked with them and made sure that they've seen value in it for themselves. So we piloted a lot and it was exactly like you said. There were many mistakes, there were many uh, times where we had to restart again, but once we have found the way it worked, once the person of the legacy business spoke positively about it, he or she then ignited the rest. And so you go by the first third, the second third, and the most difficult one is the third third because they are the most resistant and we are at the stage there now where we have to convince the third third. One more question. So you now are communicating with customers a lot through social media. Do the customers really want to be communicated with that much? It's you're an insurance company after all. How have the customer, you said satisfaction's gone up about buying a policy, but are you intruding? Are you trying to talk with them all the time? How are they taking this change? So the customer needs to drive what we need to do. And uh, it is clear, we've seen many examples where we pushed things on the customer that he or she didn't like. Think about connected car, where you tell the customer, you know, don't drive so fast, don't brake so fast. This is not how it's going to work. The customer needs to see a value in speed, needs to see a value in helping him or her to reduce their risk, 
and then they are open to partner because at the end of the day we need to move from an institution that pays bills to an institution that really partners uh, with the customer to reduce the risk and we are planting many seeds to uh, really move in that direction from investing into startups, from having our own incubator where we try to destroy ourselves rather than let others destroy us, and incremental innovation inside the company, which is to me the most important source of innovation. So there we're getting to also that idea of co-creation again. You create it with the customer and create something very new. But you mentioned connected cars, so let me turn to you, Jacques. Um, Jacques, Aschenbrook Vallejo is the developer of technology um, that's transforming vehicle transportation. Everything from fuel consumption, safe parking, start stop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, first of all, you're already developing a lot of innovative technologies yourself. So, why did you just start essentially a, a venture capital unit to invest in other people? Why? You're doing it. I think when we look at the uh, automotive business, we are facing three major revolutions. The one of the powertrain to go from uh, internal combustion engine to electrified powertrain. The second one is a connected car and autonomous car. And the third one is the mobility. Uh, you spoke about Uber, but the Uber, the Google, the DD in China, they are speaking about mobility. They don't are speaking about cars themselves. So we need to accelerate the way we change ourselves. We need to accelerate the way we innovate. And uh, like you said, and I, even I don't really like the, the word legacy business, I think we need to know in each one of those three areas what is the added value we want to take, what is our position. Uh, I don't think we can be uh, a competitor of Google, but Google will be a customer of ours, will be a partner of ours, maybe a competitor in some areas. But we need to speed up. Uh, the uh, speed today is much faster. And when we look at all the uh, startups that we are seeing, there is one major difference between big corporation and the, the speed. The speed and the fact that they want to be global. And very, very often, they want to change the world. And uh, my dream, and uh, you said you have to dream our worst nightmare. My dream is to transform Vario into a very big startup. It won't be easy from inside, and we cannot do everything by ourselves. There are lots of things that others are doing much better than we do. We need to go for internal innovation to open innovation. Uh, we have 15,000 uh, R&D people, probably the best in the world, but there are millions of uh, R&D people outside Vario. How can we connect ourselves to all those people being extremely innovative, extremely fast, having new ideas. It's impossible doing it internally, so we have to be connected with them. Sometimes we'll take shares, sometimes we won't, sometimes we'll partner, sometimes we'll make mistakes and don't partner, but we need to be much more open. And in a few last months, we have decided to uh, go with our own R&D project into incubators. We have not yet an internal incubator, but we are, some of our projects want to volunteer to go and see how it can accelerate their own innovation by being uh, uh, in few months in incubators. And that is changing a lot the mentality of our own people. So um, not only are you finding every way you possibly can to tap new ideas, it means inside the company you have to listen to them and um, are the people who are the innovators inside willing to listen to what you're learning from your partners, the companies you're investing in, the incubators you're seeing. That's a cultural transformation. It's a cultural transformation. There are a few cultural transformations. The first one is, until a few years ago, we thought we had 10 customers or 15 customers, the big OEM. And we realized today that we are much more customers. All the, uh, like I said, the Google, Uber, Didi, and so on of the world, they'll be our customers. But not only that, all the fleet managers, they'll be our customers. Uh, all the uh, rental, car rentals company, they can be our customers with a major difference. The OEMs, the car makers, they know value, they know what we are, they have a long history with us. All the others, they have not a clue what we are. They don't even know our name. Well, soon you need to have Valio inside 
on every car, but we'll ask you who are going to be the winners in that industry in a minute. So, Isabel Cocher, um, you also are starting to partner and invest differently with, you've just announced the Digital Factory, and your partners include a well-known Silicon Valley big data company and a mobile apps company. So why are you doing this in the energy sector? I thought energy was just, it flows by itself. <laughs> so absolutely not. <laughs> no, energy faces a, a fundamental revolution. And that's important, I believe, to measure that it's first of all, it's not first of all a technological revolution. It's first of all a revolution of mindset, since uh, climate change, changes everything. I mean, it's the very first global challenge for everybody. Developed countries, emerging countries, every player, and including us in this, uh, in this room. So it is a great invitation to reassess a lot of things. So the root of it is mindset. The beauty of it, that if we look at the technological changes we experienced over the last decade, we effectively believe that we face a very different energy world in the, in the future. Fully decarbonized, because the renewable technologies for power, but also for gas, in, improved a lot. So fully decarbonized, probably massively decentralized. And here, for us as big player, is probably the biggest change we, we have to manage. Why decentralized? Because for a lot of these uh, renewable technologies, and in particular that's true for solar, you can implement them, of course, large scale with big farms, as we are used to manage, but you can also implement them locally on the site of consumption. So it means that in the future, probably, the players, meaning the industrial elites, we, we were around this round table, or you at your home, you won't be only a cons consumer, pure consumer. You will always, probably you will also be a producer and an energy manager. So it means for us not an incremental change, you know? That's full of hope first, because that's the, the first time we think that we, we see the way to consile well, energy for all, you know that. Uh, Two billion people at least have not a correct access to energy in the world, so which is big trouble in terms of uh, just development. So to do that, but to do that in a sustainable way. So that's full of hope, but massive challenge for for the the big organisations we as as we are. And I, I'm sure you, you remember 20 years ago when uh, uh, Lou Gerstner became. CEO of IBM, the question for him was, how can I teach an elephant to dance? Right. And you wrote yourself a very interesting book on that. Yes. And today, to take, to, to, to take this image, I, I believe I would change a little bit the metaphor. I believe that, the, the, at least for us in the energy sector, the question is less how to teach an elephant or a big animal, a whale to dance, I believe the question is more how to transform this well in the school of fish. So you have, uh, in your own career, um, you've worked in the public sector, so after you're a physicist, and after, after you got your degrees, you worked um, in the French government, in the French budget office. Um, you also are a leader, a global leader of a nonprofit. Um, Terramat that um, is looking at alternative energy for the world. So can you help answer this question about why is it that the entrepreneurs in technology often don't believe in government and in fact in Silicon Valley often think that they get in the way and they should just do what they want to do regardless of the rules, which is why Uber and Airbnb are having some trouble even in their home cities. So what advice do you have? Because what they say is they say politicians don't get it. They say the public sector isn't ready. They say that digital can go nowhere in my community. 
driverless cars or alternative energy because the public sector doesn't get it. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs and the public sector to get on well enough that we can go ahead with the work of transforming? So I, I believe you're right. I mean, people are, are more and more fed up with institutions, political institutions, probably also industrial institutions, maybe. And that it, it is, uh, well, this move towards a more, I would say, a runs out, a rise on society, peer-to-peer -peer society, and we face people that want to take their destiny in their hands. And, well, I believe that this decentralized world I described in the energy sector is also based on that. So what is key for us, if I prolonge the image of a, a school of fish, is to be as connected, connected, connected. That's my obsession. How can I connect my company to the, well, as, uh, as broadly as we can, to the territories, to the clients, to the innovation ecosystem, because innovation, business, new ideas, new solutions won't come to the top. I don't believe in that. It will come from the interaction of our teams on the field with all these guys. And the idea is to have not only one pair of eyes, but thousands and thousands, in order to be able to understand extremely rapidly what happens around us. And that's the reason why we really we try to decentralize our company. That's the first move, decentralize the company. With the first duty for a manager on the field is to stay connected, to increase the surface of contact with, ex with outside. And I so never start, never, a discussion on strategy before having first a discussion on that. What's what is key for your stakeholders? What is vital for them? For what reason would you be critical for, for them? So we're hearing um, the word stakeholder is implied in all of the partnering that's going on, but we're also hearing this decentralized, let the people with ideas run with the ideas, find them wherever they come from, inside, outside, go with the ideas. That's what's important, not with the structure. So there's a lot of transformation going on in every industry here. Retail, I'm going to turn to Georges Passat. Um, retail is certainly going through a transformation. You have a long-standing career in retail. You went to the best hospitality schools in the world. Um, you led casino in France and then led casino and then you did Carrefour in Spain, and then later you came back to Carrefour as chairman and CEO. Carrefour invented the hypermarket. And I, real, uh, you know, I know that not everybody in your company may agree with me, but I was thinking, gee, today, couldn't we say that the world's largest hypermarket might be an Amazon warehouse? And so we're sourcing products differently, distributing them differently, and not only that Amazon warehouse, robots are picking the products, and then drones might drop them on your doorstep. So there's a big transformation going on, and yet you're highly invested in physical stores. So please tell us what your strategy is. No, the strategy is certainly a transformation strategy. But we don't want uh, to transform the company cutting its roots. Hypermarket has been a fantastically leading format, already developed uh, in more than 40 countries. This is our foundations. This is also our buying power. We have to transform the company, uh, taking care of the different formats we have uh, after the merger with Promodes. We are not only hypermarket. Hypermarket is 50% of our business, mm. but we also have thousands of supermarkets and thousands of little convenience stores. So our strategy is to strengthen our roots, being the best store as possible, based on a food strategy. We want to be a food platform with different formats. Different formats with different prices, different offers, different services. So now the challenge is not to refute the idea 
that new technologies will transform our business. We have to plug new technologies of our existing company, considering that uh, internet and smartphone are the new screens in which we have to appear with all our qualities. So the transformation is certainly technological. We have to put new technologies of our IT existing system. We have to be near the consumer. As an example in France today, in less than five minutes, everybody can find a Carrefour store. I'm not sure that it is easily beatable by delivering products by a warehouse or from a warehouse at one hour or two hours uh, from the town. The last point is that we need absolutely to open the minds of our people. You said many times we have to listen. We have to listen more inside. We have to listen a lot outside. And we have to put our customers in the middle of the company because they are really owning the company. So this is the biggest change. It's a psychological change. Keeping experience, bringing new blood, opening the windows, and staying alive. Is it a big challenge? It's a fantastically interesting challenge. We have all the quality to stay and become certainly one of the food leading companies in the world. And we, have n we are not afraid of anyone. We are, of course, respecting our competition, but we are not afraid at all. So I have a, 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 another question to you, and maybe Barry Diller will have a company that's actually working on this, because now it's not just mobile devices that are doing everything, it's anything. It's the Internet of Things. It's everything coming alive. So do you imagine that there could be a day when your smart refrigerator not only tells you what you're out of and automatically orders it, but it co-creates with the store what your meals ought to be this week, given your family's profile, who's traveling, um, what your needs are, and so you're actually designing. So you become the designers of what people are eating rather than the suppliers of products. And it's all done through your smart refrigerator. Is that day, do you think, going to come? And, you know, now that we see that um, Jacques and, and Thomas and Isabel all have some kind of incubator working on futuristic things, do you, are you anticipating things like that? And could a Barry Diller IAC company come along and suddenly transform the stores again? Oh, listen, I think we, we go probably w to a more predictive way of serving the consumer. But honestly, if in the future, you know, our consumers need to have on their fridge an indication that they need milk, we have to worry, we'll have a lot of problems outside uh, retail itself. I believe that human people, they will still take control of their life. So I refute the idea of that the new technologies will totally drive our life. This is why we maintain physical stores, service quality, and we are sure that it's better when it's good. And uh, this is not a technological approach, it's a philosophical approach. If we can merge both of them, I think that will be the success. So what, by the way, this is not necessarily my point of view about the smart refrigerator taking over. At Harvard Business School, we learn to ask provocative questions to elicit ideas. But in fact, you're saying that the human still wants the human. So I want to come back to many of you with this because Barry, in the travel business, the latest hot new thing is that you can actually reach an individual on the telephone to help you. That's the latest hot new thing, despite having gone totally digital. Is that true? Mm, not really. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, you, we can take it, this, all this too far. We can, you know, we can take the, the, definitely the advance of technology, uh, which is, of course, advancing, and we can make incredibly silly applications of it, of which I'm sure you can see much on that floor, as you can any place. Good ideas, actually original ideas, are relatively few. The, you know, the, it, it is not the mass of everything. Everything is, is, you know, is 
not going to change to absolute artificial intelligence and therefore disregard all of us and make us slaves or all of the other horrors that people talk about. It is going to aid us, but we shouldn't all think that we're essentially dinosaurs because we're at one, we're, at a, we're maybe not at the cuttingest of cutting edge of technology. And these things come in train, in stream, and, and uh, when they come, great, bounce on them. But again, 2,000, 1,000, 1,000 ideas, picking among them, you'll find a very few that'll be apl uh, applicable to whatever it is that you're either doing or, or that you want to do. Well, so, but the human, though, I thought that was a new thing in the, in the travel business, that it won't all be done. You'll have a representative. I'm always on those menus, and, um, and finally I get frustrated and say, representative, because they say I don't understand you. Well, then, then, then you're being offered a bad service. I mean, Expedia is a technology company. And yes, do we have a lot of people who talk on the phone to people? Sure we do, because travel is an extremely complex thing to do. But in fact, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the sites, our sites, if they don't serve you, our, look, our goal is what is the shortest time on the telephone, how quickly can we do it, but what's the shortest time that we can spend, and how little time can we spend because the technology is actually serving you. It's a failure, actually, if you have to talk to somebody. Now, that's, you know, that's not necessarily true in all transactions. It may not be true for insurance, which is also a complex pro uh, product. But I do not think the world is now reversing itself to say talk to somebody simply because humans like talking to humans, which, by the way, they really don't like. <laughs> so, Thomas, what do you think about that? Insurance, do you think, is the human still in the equation? Definitely, because what is insurance? You are buying a promise from a company, but essentially from somebody. You need to look somebody in the eye or listen to somebody to have confidence. And therefore, I fully believe the human is today and will be in the future in the center. For me, it's a question of triage, as you say. You need to make sure that what you can automate and what uh, offers convenience and simplicity is being done automatically but where you need the human, you need to put him and her in the center. And it's about the blended experience that the two go together, digital and physical, as perceived as one, and not in competition or two parts where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So physical hasn't totally disappeared, we're hearing, particularly in retail. And, it, and human may not have totally disappeared. The question about cars. Back to cars, because will the human disappear? I rode in a Google Lexus at South by Southwest in Austin, and um, I actually wished the human had not been behind the wheel, because it not only was she not adding any value, but um, it was hard to get the experience of what it was like. But here is an area in which they say the human, the human driver will disappear, and in fact, Contrary to what Thomas just said about insurance being complex and needing the human, in the automotive safety world, the self-driving car is a little safer than the human, although a little more cautious. They were slower. I would have pulled out at that intersection a lot faster than the self-driving car did. But what's the role of the human in mobility? What is extremely interesting is we make a lot of survey of what are the wishes of the customers, not our OE customers, but the customer of our customers. And uh, it's clear that they want safer car, more connected car, more autonomous car. They want greener car. And at the same time, they want fun to drive. So autonomous car and fun to drive are quite oxymoron. It's, uh, but I, I think why should somebody win the battle? Why shall we not have in the future people wanting to drive their cars when it makes fun and be driven when it doesn't make fun to drive? And then we can see what will happen in the 5, 10, 20, 50 years. I'm pretty sure that in the next years, and only look at the figures. Uh, if you look at the American market in the US, 
the market of cars, new cars and the second cars is eleven hundred billion dollars a year. If you look at the taxi or the uh, uh, car sharing business is ten billion. So there's a huge way to go to imagine that we'll go from uh, car being owned, being driven, to uh, car being sold as a service and mobility service. I think there will be a very, very long time where we'll see both usage of the car, the self-driven car, I'm going to drive my car, the more and more autonomous car in the city area, for example, when you are in a traffic jam, you would like to be connected and give the responsibility to the car when it doesn't make fun to drive. And of course, the mobility service, like BlaBlaCar, or even the car sharing. When you don't use your car, why shouldn't you rent your car? And there are some startups in France, like Drivey, for example, or, or Kulika, that are having that service of, as a private people, you can rent your car for a few hours, few days, when you don't use your car. So I think we'll be huge area of new services which should be at the beginning for the years to come complementary to the own car but things are going in a direction and we don't know today what will be the equilibrium of all that. That's why we need a lot of improvisation we can't quite script it but I think at least three of you sitting here the next three next to me could be partnering you could be partners because you're working on reducing fuel consumption Isabel, your company sells energy, but on the other hand, you want it to be greener and want the planet to be greener so you could figure out how to work together. And Thomas, you're going to have to be there for the risks in all of these new things, like your car, renting your car for a few hours, and who's driving it. That's a really seriously big question. Do you ever think about going far outside your industry. I have a, a saying that, you know, we say creativity means thinking outside the box. I say the box isn't big enough. You have to think outside the building, which means outside of your offices, outside of your company, outside of your industry. So would you ever think we could do a little deal here right on stage, the three of you getting together? And maybe then you'll end up delivering some groceries that people have handpicked from a wonderful Carrefour store, um, and I'll figure out a Diller connection later. But um, do you, what do you think? Maybe to answer that question, uh, I have two board members, recent board members. One is in the board members of NG, oh, and the right. other one is coming uh, from AXA. So that's right. we really try to apply you are your advice. And it's those interlocking directorates, yeah. But, but, but I think beyond this, it's extremely important to look at partnership and it's something new because in the past we've always been thinking if there's something new, we do it ourselves. My experience is if you go outside your industry, the solution of tomorrow lies at the boundary of your industry and another one. And for example, in our case, I mean, health business is uh, very far advanced in that respect. We are talking to health companies, we are talking to food and nutrition companies. On the car side, on the energy side, it's starting but could be a little more. Yes, energy and telecom should be getting together too. Yeah, absolutely. So if we believe in the world where the energy management will be integrated more and more in the tools, meaning houses, cars, homes, and buildings, etc., maybe uh, one day uh, roads. I don't, I don't know if you have seen the uh, innovation from, uh, uh, from uh, one of the big BTP uh, company. Uh, maybe closes one day, our specialist, specialists say. So it means that we have to work with all the sectors, the industrial sectors, in order to reassess the way to manage energy. So we start working with car sector, with uh, well, real estate sector, which is uh, also um, a big uh, energy consumption. You know, it is part of the connectivity I mentioned. Partners, big partnerships, and uh, that's a strategy we. Uh, we effectively imp implement. Rosa, may I go back to one point you mentioned about human? What about human part in the future? As far as energy is concerned, I'd like just to, tell, to say to what extent I believe human behavior will be more and more key. Of course, they, they, it will be supported by new tools, new technologies, and digital in particular. Let's, but it will be first a question of 
active behavior from, from people. Uh, an example just, we have now the possibility to ask you as a customer, what do you want to spend this month in your bill for energy in your house? And you, you answer, you say X. And then the tool are able to tell you, okay, you have to change your behavior like that, like that, like that. But you, as a consumer, you are key. First of all, you decide the budget you want to spend. I don't know if today you decide really, not sure. I don't know even if you know the budget you spent. So we'll, you will become more and more active. And in the way you manage then day to day your energy consumption, it will be, well, uh, your decision every day. So human part will be, uh, I, I'm sure of that, uh, most and most important. So I want to ask you, George, about new kinds of partners for Carrefour that you might not have imagined in the past. And then we may have a new business. I'm going to have to, somebody's going to have to show me the countdown clock because I don't know how much time we have left because I was thinking that we would also have a new service for Barry Diller's company, Match.com, which is matching companies with partners, not just individuals with dates, but companies with other kinds of companies that they might partner with. But so, George, who do you think about partnering with in retail that you might not have thought about in the past because of transformation? No, but I think we are entering in a conversational era where we need to talk to the surroundings and also inside the company. I think it's more than time to understand that everybody can bring a contribution to this transformation. And I agree with you that a lot of uh, potential partners have not been today identified as capable to bring new ideas in our businesses. So opening windows, bringing new technologies, bringing new blood, linking them to experience is the key, for me, the key uh, challenge for transformation. And I'm absolutely sure that if we put the customer at the center of all of it, we will win. Uh, and we will stay human. But conversation is probably the new, the, new, the new trend. The key problem is that we have to filter the huge amount of data that will come to us and make sure that it will not be a source of wasting time and unintelligence. So big challenge, interesting challenge, since human challenge, and I'm asking for new partners to bring new ideas because we always look for what we don't get. We are looking for ideas and money. Thank you. So do you have any good ideas about matching businesses? <laughs> or um, what, are, what are the cutting edge propositions that are part of IAC now that are, that are not just dealing with consumers, but taking into account the transformation of whole industries? Well, it's too big a macro. There's no way I can answer it in terms of such a world, world view, because I don't have one. And as far as matching companies, I think you know most companies that actually match themselves with others usually fail. So I'm not you know, all that for that kind of combination. Um, OK, so nobody still has told me how much time we have left. Would one of the crew who are maybe listening to this let me know? 10 minutes. Oh, sorry. Thank you. How'd you get that word? OK, thank you. 10 minutes. Oh, thank you. That's, that's, is it an Apple Watch or a digital watch or just a watch watch? No, when it comes to watches, I'm very traditional. Swiss quality still counts. So Swiss quality is a very good um, note on which to ask the last question, because I did com keep coming back to where's the human, where's the traditional. Um, and the Swiss watch industry is a very good example of total reinvention. It should have been wiped out by the Japanese um, te technology-oriented watches, and it wasn't. It came back because of the value people placed on craftsmanship. And not just knowing there was a human touch, but feeling that they had a unique product and that it had been made in a very traditional way. So, as we're talking about transformation, my question for each of you is what should not change? What should be 
something you hang on to. Because there is a tendency in this world, it was happened in the dawn of the internet, it happened in the dot-com boom, to say all old models are obsolete. And it's all going to be totally different. And you are a dinosaur if you don't get with it. But what should remain the same no matter what? Besides service, we were hearing service. What should remain the same? Do you want to, do you want to start, Jacques, in your industry? What should remain the same? I, I think it's an extremely difficult question because the, the world is going much faster today than uh, it was going before. In, in our companies, the, we have spoken about the customers, and it's clear that we need to take care of our customers, especially when we have very little number of customers like we have. But at the same time, what is the most important is our people. That there are people that will drive our change. And we cannot drive the change against our people. And uh, I'm going to tell you a, a story that has happened a few weeks ago. We are investing extremely quickly in the cobot, in, ro in the uh, collaborative robots, in order to increase dramatically our productivity. And that is a new technology which is linked with the digital. And uh, we have presented that to our unions in France and in Europe. And believe it or not, the direction of the unions in France was, are you sure you were going fast enough? So I think there is a deep understanding in our companies that if we don't change, we'll die. But on the other way, we cannot do the change without having our people on board. And that makes a whole difficulty. So what shouldn't change is try to have our people on board and make them change themselves, giving the time to be able to change. Isabel, what shouldn't change? You know, I, I believe that the, the the more you open the doors, you the, the more you, you invite people to innovate, the more you need fixed points. And I believe that two are extremely important. First of all, a common sense of purpose. Because, if you, again, if you organize the fact that innovation is boiling everywhere, you need to guide things. And then a common sense, a strong purpose to, to be more and more purpose-driven company is something which is key. So we, to give you an example, we decided to be the, the, really the pioneer of this new uh, type of decentralized and decarbonized uh, world I described, um, and more generally to be a leader of this new energy um, uh, type of uh, solutions. And we decided to be extremely coherent, to, to build this sense of purpose. And then we decided to dispose what is not in this framework. So we have a 15 billion disposal program, which is not nothing. And in parallel, we reinvest in technologies which are in, at the core of what we want to, 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 uh, to develop. So sense of purpose, you have to make, to make it. that's the challenge that everybody in the company has really deeply in mind what is the global purpose of, of your group? First fixed point. I believe it's absolutely key. The second one, and by the way, that's the, the best way to get the highest motivation also. And second one is a sense of result. Our big groups, I believe we all manage to build a culture of results, culture of permanent assessment, culture to measure things. So if, even if the kind of technology solutions are expected to change, this obsession of results, permanent improvement, of course, that's our asset. But it's a key part of what we are able and, and used to manage. So I would say these two things, and maybe a third one if I have time enough, yeah. uh, which is to, well, to, to build a culture where the fear is no longer to fail, but the fear is, well, not to try enough, which is uh, something in, uh, in our companies uh, we, we have to pay a lot of attention uh, to, I believe. Thomas. For me, the why shouldn't change, only the what should change. When we talk about dinosaurs and legacy business, we always imply that whatever we do today is not valid anymore and needs to completely change. I think this is not true. 
what we are doing today is extremely valuable for society, has a purpose, has a sense um, and has a value add. Therefore, it's working well and that's where we come from. We should not forget our roots, but we should rethink the what. How are we giving our service, how are we delivering it and how are we interpreting our business model in a new way. And that is the challenge. This how needs to happen, yes, in a, uh, in a way where we change quickly, but it's more like a marathon. You should not sprint and then be completely exhausted. You should increase the pace, but slowly, and it's like a, a weighing machine where you put weights on the other side, and at some point the business model flip. But you mustn't put all your weights on the other side immediately so that the business model is destroyed. The why doesn't change, only the what. So our hearing values and purpose is a thread through all of this. George? I would say uh, we should not uh, avoid our aspirations for quality and for intangible assets as culture. I think this is a long tradition, maybe mainly in Europe. We have uh, to consider it as a strong and competitive advantage, we have to consider that we, it's up to us to maintain this level of consciousness and not disappear totally behind volumes and figures. If I may say, it should be changes are totally acceptable, but this is not the only condition to go to uh, the future. So it's not change for the sake of change. Barry? Uh, decency, fairness, values, the process of solutions should not change. Solutions will solve things, but the process is not going to change. I do not think it's going to change and it shouldn't change. It's the verities that shouldn't change. Everything else can and will if it should. So the bedrock, it sounds, is Quality, decency, fairness, a set of values, a way of treating people, a way of thinking about what one owes the customer. So those don't change. That's very important. Maybe there are some other things that don't change. The Media Lab at MIT, which is always experimenting with lots of things, had a device at one point um, where you could put your hand into it and you could feel somebody else's hand from far away. I, thought, I found it actually intriguing and a little creepy. And um, I wondered if we really wanted to automate the KISS, for example. We might, we're going to, through artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, we're automating a lot of the ways we can get data to make decisions. But whether we want to actually use technology to replace the human is a question that um, is very much on people's minds, and we've talked about it a little bit here. So we're about, to, uh, as we end, I want to ask each of you for a word of wisdom to the audience, which may have both startups, entrepreneurs, innovators in mid-sized companies, and also some established companies like yours. What's a word of wisdom about thinking about this new era? And let's go in this direction, Barry. Um, back to Jacques. Uh, I have no idea. I just hope that they do. <laughs> Humility might be a good idea. Um, George? A word of wisdom for the audience to take away? I, I'm, I was thinking about partnership between us. <laughs> and I saw that Jacques should organize his automatic cars in order they go directly to my parkings in the future. I will give him the address of all of them. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you, Thomas. Thank you. So now I had 30 seconds to think. Um, if you want to change, if you want to transform your company, you need to transform yourself. You need to reinvent yourself because you as a leader are the limit of the transformation of the company. Isabel? I believe that all these dimensions we, we all mentioned, and it's, uh, the, there is a lot of convergence between us, I feel. Um, well, it's, it's 
highlight the importance of the change in leadership. The leader is no longer somebody who tells to people what they have to do. The leader is more and more uh, people that, will, that has to help people to uh, meet with what their clients want, which is absolutely not the same kind of mindset. So, uh, well, strong leadership change to uh, organize uh, the company fully the other way, coming from the bottom to the, to the top. Jacques? I think for the first time since a very, very long time, the future is not written. We have to write our future. Create the future. Don't let it happen to you. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. There's much more wisdom in the room. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.